Welcome, everyone. It's, uh, again, a pleasure to have you here uh, with us. Uh, Nancy's over there and my mom's sitting with me today. Um, really appreciate the time you're taking out of your day to come and pray with, pray with us, to pray with me, and also to uh, listen to a psalm together and reflect on uh, the message that God gives us through the psalms. Uh, I was looking at the, the CDC site, that's generally what I looked at, look at in the middle of this pandemic, and in the Washington Department of Health site, and then our own Kitsap uh, uh, Health District site, and so on. And I also look at other states. You can uh, click on that map in the CDC site, and we'll take you to any state uh, to their health departments, and you can get um, accurate uh, statistics and so on of what's going on. As of uh, yesterday, we had 374,000 people uh, down with the virus, over a quarter of a million people now. And as of yesterday, we have uh, 12,000 deaths in our country, 12,000 families. Some of these are in the same family, but 12,000 families roughly in the midst of uh, profound grief today. And so we turn to our God in prayer. Father, the world you created is hurting today. All around the glo globe, families are grieving the loss of loved ones and family and friends. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And yet we know that nothing passes your scrut scrutiny, nothing passes your sight. And I wonder, why are you allowing this, Lord? And I can easily jump to conclusions. Father, I do know that you continually love this world. And so I, I pray for our own nation and for the nations around the world, for Italy and Spain and Germany and France and Brit Great Britain, countries that are being uh, hit very severely with this pandemic, with Iran right now being hit very, very severely, for Iraq, for our soldiers serving overseas, Lord. Um, we thank you for their service and we pray for your protection on their lives, both from uh, being soldiers, but also from this pandemic, Lord. I pray for New York City and for the state of New York and New Jersey and Michigan and Pennsylvania, that Northeast uh, quadrant is just overrun with this pandemic. Father, they're predicting that it will peak in about seven to 10 days. And the numbers are rising quickly. 40,000 new cases yesterday in the U.S. Father, in the midst of this, we just pray that your will would be done. I don't pretend to understand what that will is. Other than I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger and abounding in this loving kindness and truth, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but by no means leaving the guilty unpunished. We thank you that that punishment fell on our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that the stroke due us fell upon his back, that the rod that was for, for us was applied to Jesus in our stead. Father, we cry out to you today. We cry out to you not, not for ourselves, Lord, but for all those people in the world who have no hope, are living without hope right now. We pray that people would find hope, true hope, the hope of your promise. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes, she who believes, has eternal life. 
Or again, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. She does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Or again, for God so loved the world. For Lord, you so loved the world that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, I pray that that clarion call of the gospel would circle the globe. Just as that light is shining in the picture, that that light of your word would shine into people's hearts and give them that certain hope that we have. That when you promise, you do not ever break your promise. You are incapable of lying and you are incapable of breaking a promise, Lord. And I give you praise for your faithfulness. Oftentimes we are faithful, but we give you praise that you are always faithful. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bring this pandemic to an end. I pray that you would comfort those families all around the globe and in our own country who are grieving. Even yesterday, I, I last night, I saw a report of a husband and wife who died uh, together, both from COVID-19. Father, our families are being broken apart. Our families are being shattered. But I thank you that there is a reconciliation coming, a homecoming, a return to a home to which we've never been, but to a home which we have longed to be in ever since our birth. We have eternity in our hearts, Lord. May people here in the midst of this pandemic that call of the heart for eternity, that call of the heart to know their creator, that call of the heart to know the one who has fashioned us while we were yet in our mother's womb, the one who in his very character is love itself, compassion and grace. So be gracious to us, O Lord. Forgive us for our complacency Forgive us for the times when we've gone our own way and sought our own path. Forgive our world, Lord, you already have in Jesus Christ. But the world stands unacquitted, not yet acquitted, not yet just justified, until we turn to you and receive your gift of life. Father, I'm reminded of the words in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. This we all know, Lord. We all have the dying in our bodies. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, the free gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to keep your promise. Thank you, Lord, for the hope of heaven. Thank you that we can face whatever lies ahead, whatever circumstances uh, may be ahead for our families and for us. The worst thing that hap can happen for us, well, actually, the best thing that can happen for us is that we come home, rushing into your arms, rushing into the glory of your presence, rushing into an undying and unfathomable love, Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for loving each person listening to my voice right now. Thank you for loving me, Lord, even when none of us deserved it. And in this is love, that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your tremendous love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, uh, good morning. It's uh, really nice, or good afternoon now. It's really nice to have you here again. We're looking at Psalm 9. It's a Psalm of David, and it's um, it's called a Muthlaban, um, Muthlaban and which means 
Death to the Sun. And I'm not sure why it's on Muth Laban, on Death to the Sun. I'm not sure why that's there. It might be a kind of a musical term that spoke of a kind of a cr crescendoing piece of music. We don't really know. Uh, those instructions are for the choir director. So this psalm was sung by a choir, which is odd because it's a song. It's a psalm of judgment, of severe judgment, and um, against the enemies of David and against the enemies of the Lord. It's a psalm of David. So I'm just going to read through it, and then we'll return and uh, have a, several reflections on it. Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. <clears throat> when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins, and you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death. That I may tell of all your praises that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in, in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made known, has made himself known. Again, the Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. Higayon, Selah. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations who for, forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. So now we get back to the beginning of the psalm. Um, we don't know the context of this psalm as far as what was going on in David's life. It uh, doesn't sound like he was king yet. We don't really know, but he's been pursued all through those years uh, when Saul was after him and the armies of Saul were after him. He hid out in caves, and uh, but we don't know exactly the timing of this psalm. Now let's uh, uh, read through it again, and we'll, uh, I'll give you several reflections. I will give thanks to the Lord. So he begins his psalm of judgment by thanking God. And who is the Lord? Uh, again, it's L-O-R-D in capital letters. So we know that that's the name Yahweh. Some Bibles uh, translate it as Jehovah. Um, it's the four letters of, of the most holy name of God, Y-H-W-H. -H. Uh, it's sometimes 
Uh, back in Exodus 3, 12 through 14, uh, we learn that it's the I am who I am. I am, tell, tell the Israelite people, he's speaking to Moses, tell the Israelite people that I am sent you. And then a few verses later, it's associated with the name Yahweh, the Lord. So we think that the Lord is the noun form of it, and the I am is, is the uh, verbal form of it. I am is the one who holds life in himself. He doesn't need to have life come from someone outside of him like we do. He has the ability to live within his own being. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. We have this divide between head and heart, which I've mentioned before, with, and the he Hebrew people did not have that dualistic uh, divide between their mind and, their, and what we consider our emotional life. When they say heart, they meant their mind, their thought, their thoughts. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my mind, with all my thoughts, with all my being. And that would include the emotions. They didn't make that divide. I will tell of all your wonders. First of all, that those wonders uh, herald back to the 10 plagues in Egypt, um, to the taking of Pharaoh's son, to the river of the Nile turning to blood, to um, the locusts uh, who came into the land, and, and so on. Those wonders, and then the wonder of being led through the Red Sea as God parted the waters, and then as the Egyptian army came in after them, the Lord let the waves crash over them and destroy the entire Egyptian army. Or the wonders of giving manna and water in the desert and keeping them clothed and, and fed, uh, shoes on their feet that never wore out. For 40 years they wandered, and yet even in their rebellion, the Lord never turned his back on them. Uh, he always watched out for them. I will tell of your wonders in my own life. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, and I will tell of his wonders. When I was 23 years old, I went out drinking with my friends at Vandy Camp's Dutch Bakery. Most of you know this story. But I went wild that we had gone out to the bars, um, University Bar and Grill in the U District, and I had gotten wildly drunk, blacked out. We went back to work. I went berserk, went running out onto the street, and uh, my friend Doug, Doug caught me by the hand, and I pulled away, and as I charged down Valley towards Yale, I fell and hit my head against the curb, and immediately I threw up. They got me in their car, and instead of taking me to the hospital, they just took me home and threw me on my bed. And they were so drunk, they ended up spending the night on my floor. Next morning, I woke up, and I had this enormous lump on my head, size of a grapefruit. And I thought, man, boy, this isn't good. And I took a shower and, and went to call Vandy Camps to tell them I wouldn't be able to come into work. And I couldn't speak. I had no words. I uh, couldn't say a word to the gal on the phone. My friends saw that something was drastically wrong, so they rushed me to the hospital. And after taking a CAT scan, as soon as they saw me, they rushed me in to get a CAT scan. Afterwards, Dr. Lozier, the head of the neurology department for the University of Washington uh, Medical School and for the hospital, came in with about seven to eight interns with them. The interns were saying, let's drill, and boy, was I uh, frightened. They wanted to drill, and the Dr. Lozier said, it's, it's too late. He's let it bleed for over 12 hours. All that blood will be coagulated. I had no idea how serious that head injury was back then. Um, years later, I, I ordered my chart from them for because I had this stuttering problem. You may, maybe notice it. I, don't, I do notice it afterwards when I look back at uh, my sermons, but uh, that's caused by the scar tissue from that head injury. It causes little... Uh, seizures in my brain that caused me to, to uh, sometimes lose my words. Um, anyway, I ordered that chart, and when it came back, I had, I had had five bleeds in my brain, including one in my speech center. Dr. Lozier said, Grant, I don't think you're going to live. I think you've, you've done yourself in. I don't think you're going to live. But if you do live, you'll never speak again. I had seven days to lie in that hospital thinking about my life. On a third day, uh, Dr. Lozier came in and he said, Grant, say the word bird. And I couldn't say it. Knew how to say it, what it was, but no pathway to get it out. And then my father called supporting churches all over the United States. Ann Nemolov, our own church, was one of the women who prayed for me down in San Jose. And by the seventh day, the Lord returned words to me. Not to tell of my own glory, not to tell of myself but to tell of his wonders. 
of his kindness that would take this punk drug addict and drug dealer and just a wreck of a man and transform my life, giving me a wife and two wonderful daughters, a second mom who I love dearly. And he has restored my life. He has been renewing my life from one degree of glory to another. And I'm being fashioned just as you are being fashioned in Christ into the very image of God. So I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders, the wonder of what he's done in my life. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Once when I was young in junior high, we were up at Paradise at Mount Rainier when they had that circular uh, observation um, uh, deck and it was kind of a museum and so on. And we were standing outside, they had all these picnic tables around in the alcoves uh, underneath the roof of that round building. And there was a group of people from Israel who were uh, together, there was maybe 10 or 12 of them. And they had been drinking a little bit, so they were uh, joyous, if you will. But they, they joined arms together locked arms around each other in this circle, and then they started dancing in wild hilarity, in wild rejoicing. Uh, as S Swedish people and people from Great Britain and Scandinavian people, uh, some of us anyway, uh, we, we are with gladsome mind, praise the Lord. Uh, we don't get excited about them very much, but man, if I could show you how I feel about the Lord and what he's done in my life, I would be standing out shouting and jumping up and down uh, for praise. I will sing praise to your name, to the name Yahweh, to the Lord, the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and, and truth, who forgives iniquity, rebellion, and sin, and yet by no means leaves the guilty unpunished. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So he's recognizing that Yahweh is higher than all other would-be gods. This is the true God. This is the one who, when he was on the planet in the mystery of the Trinity, said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, through Jesus. It goes on, it says, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. So now here we have uh, the judgment coming. Part of this psalm is judgment. Part of it is praise. Part of it is petition. When my en enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. Uh, David had enemies. We know this. It was Saul and his armies. Uh, Absalom, his own son, came after him uh, with much of Israel. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. Dangerous thing to come against those who are anointed of God. Dangerous thing to come against uh, his beloved. Uh, they stumble and perish before you. Although I get a little bit nervous always talking about enemies versus us. Because in of ourselves, we were all, all once enemies in our minds. People who have turned our backs on God and in some sense shook our fist in his face. Looking to ourselves to be God's looking to ourselves to be sources of righteousness and goodness and everything, uh, everything we need, we look to ourselves, especially in the United States. We are so self-sufficient and self-reliant. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my just cause. Literally, it's you have maintained my, my righteous cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. I get a little bit nervous when David says, you have maintained my righteous cause, my just cause, because this, this is the same David who likely hadn't uh, seen Bathsheba from the, from the, uh, up in the balcony of, of his palace, looking down and seeing Bathsheba on a roof bathing, uh, apparently, uh, obviously naked. And so he was filled with lust, um, had her uh, sent for, had his way with her, which was an abuse of, of, uh, political power, if you will. Uh, she was not a willing participant as a, a woman. She had no say against the king. Uh, nothing is spoken of her response to it other than uh, she ended up pregnant. And now David's in, in a pickle. 
uh, how's he going to explain this one away? So he sends for Uriah to come home uh, on leave, and Uriah is such a righteous man, he stays camped out by the, by the palace. He's not going to go in and uh, be with his wife in that husband and wife way. And so then David finally orders uh, Joab, I think it is, to have him uh, put out at the front of the battle and then for the uh, rest of the army to pull back so that Uriah will be killed. David committed adultery. He lied. He stole. He coveted a man's wife. He literally took the Lord's name in vain as an anointed king. He murdered. He dishonored his mother and father in doing all of this. You think about it, he just broke uh, every commandment in the book. You have maintained my just cause. Well, I'm reminded of Romans that says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Together we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. And Paul is quoting from both the law and the Psalms. So it makes me nervous when I hear David talking this way. But it's a good thing. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. We don't always have righteous judgments in our society. Sometimes money talks. The amount of money we can hire the best lawyers and so on. Uh, justice is when the truth will be uh, kept the truth will be kept and the truth will be held up on high. The truth will be held. And so whatever the truth is in a situation, in a case of injustice, as you will, I think about sex trafficking in our society. There will become a day when the judge of judges who sits on his throne, he will judge righteously. I think about those who abuse children sexually and physically. I think about those who murder and steal. And, and yet at the same time, his grace knows no bounds. If you would but turn to me and call out on my name, Jesus, save me. He will save the vilest of us. For one such as these sits before you. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. I'm thankful that there is a day coming when everything will be put to right. Those who have not received that free gift of life will get their just desserts. Does that excite me? By no means. It grieves me. But when I think of the awful atrocities that are being committed even in our lifetime, all those Christians who died in the 20th century, more Christians were per persecuted and put to death in the 20th century than all the other 19 centuries put together. Their blood cries out from the ground. The blood of 66 million aborted babies cries out from the ground. And I wonder what the deafening roar of their silence and the cry of their blood sounds like to our Father. There come a day when you have sat on the throne judging righteously, you still sit on that throne. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. You think about the, the uh, nations that were persecuting Israel and persecuting David. We don't even hardly remember their names anymore. We certainly don't remember the names of the rulers or the names of the people, the citizens of those countries. Does he still rebuke nations? At times, does he come and destroy the wicked? When I had a head injury, I was one step away from the Lord taking me home. I had entrusted my life to Christ when I was eight years old. I had believed. Uh, I know that back then he had given me the gift of eternal life. And yet I was hurting so many people. That, that head injury was kind of like my last warning him saying, time to come home, Grant. He made it clear to me about the third day, the fourth day in, in my stay in the hospital. Time to come home, Grant. And I came running home. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. 
over time these rulers will be forgotten. In their glory, they had such power and such might, such ruthlessness and such terror that they could in invoke in people's hearts. And now we don't even remember who they are. The enemy has come to an end. I think of, about our own context. Jesus says to love our enemies. We are to look at everyone through the cross of Christ. But the true enemy, Satan and his cohorts, his principalities and his powers and his rulers and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies, they will come to an end in perpetual ruins. And you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. Cities like Sodom and Gomorrah and even Jericho, uh, those original cities are gone. They are forgotten. And even cities like Ephesus and uh, some of the cities in Israel, we remember their names, but they are no more. But the Lord Yahweh abides forever. He remains forever. While the evil that we do, especially cities, cities are, are bastions of evil oftentimes. Back in Ex or Genesis, if you read through Genesis, you get this idea that cities were a uh, locus, a focus of evil. Oftentimes, and we see that in our day too, cities can be full of uh, sin and evil and rebellion. They pass away, but the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. So there is his throne of judgment coming, the great white throne it's called. As Christians, we do not come un into that judgment. Truly, truly, I, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life has eternal life and does not come into judgment he has established his throne for judgment right now he sits on the throne of grace and he invites us to approach that throne of grace that's why i have that throne there you notice the throne of grace with uh, the thorn the, the crown of thorns and the cross we approach the throne of grace, not because we have any uh, merit or not that we have anything in ourselves that we consider worthy to approach his throne of grace. We approach because he has beckoned us to come. And he will judge the world in righteousness. Is he judging the world in righteousness now? I can't answer that because to answer that, um, I would have to be God. But certainly I've had questions. Why are you allowing this, Lord? Why are you allowing this pandemic at this time in this season? And I can't help but think the world has been running away from God as, as uh, fast and as furious as they can. And I get the sense that he allows things like this to happen because of how much he loves us. If you have a little child running out into the street, a three-year-old, and you tell him, don't run out into the street, and it's a busy street, you will get that child's attention and convince him that, or convince her that running out into the street is a really bad idea. Not because of judgment, if you were jud judging that, that little kid, you would just let him run. Let him get hit by the car. Let him lose their life. Which of you would do that to your kid? If we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So again, even right now, Father, I pray that you would fill all of us, everyone listening who has entrusted their life to you, with your Holy Spirit, with this extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit. And he will judge the world in righteousness with right judgment, fair judgment, with justice, with truth. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity, meaning it will be fair. It won't be unfair. But I'm also glad that he's not just just, because he was just just, we would all be toast. He could all send us to an eternal destruction in hell. But he is more than just. He is more than fair. He responds to us with the cross. He responds to us with a crown of thorns. 
The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. What words for us today? The Lord, Yahweh, and we know that this is Jesus because he says, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the vine, you are the branches, and so on. I am the door of the sheep. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed. Are you feeling oppressed today? Maybe not by human beings, but by the enemy or by this pandemic. The Lord is our stronghold, a stronghold in times of trouble. What is a stronghold? It was a place you could go to to protect yourself from the enemies. In the old days, we called these places castles. But I think for David, oftentimes it was a cave up in the mountains, hidden away where nobody could find him, a stronghold in times of trouble. And get this, it's not our righteousness, it's not our goodness, not our merits. Jesus is our stronghold. He is our safe place. When you have Jesus, you have everything you will ever need. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him we have redemption and sanctification and righteousness and wisdom. He is our stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. Those who know your name, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That name, those who know your character, and we know that, as I mentioned a couple uh, weeks ago uh, in my sermon, when we looked at uh, treasure hidden in earthen vessels, that that name uh, is lived out in, in the life of Christ, in his life and in his death on the cross. And so those who know your name, those who know how compassionate you are, God, how gracious you are, that steadfast, never failing love that is ours in Christ Jesus, will put our trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. In the Romans it says, there is no one who seeks you. So in the mystery of the gospel, there are no volunteers for Jesus uh, my seminary professor, John Weborg, said, look through the New Testament and you will find no volunteers for Jesus who successfully came after. You only have those who are called, those sought out after, those who are found by the Lord. Have you been found by the Lord? Maybe he's finding you today. Maybe he's calling you home. He's seeking you out. He's seeking your highest good. He never takes into account a list of wrongs suffered. He keeps no lists on you because he has forgiven us. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Well, we have yet to seek him. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. Sing praises to Yahweh for what he's done, for his compassion and his graciousness. Declare among the peoples his deeds. That's what I've been about now for 35 years. Some people get tired of hearing my story. Oh, well, it's my story to tell. He has been so kind to me and so gracious. We declare among the peoples his deeds. He's been kind to you and gracious to you too. You don't have to have my witness, my testimony. You have your testimony, which he has brought you out of whatever kinds of sins you were a master of, that you had your degree in, whether it was pride or self-righteousness or whatever. And so we declare what he's done in our life. He's healed me twice significantly. He's uh, restored me. He's brought me out of a life of debauchery. He's freed me of addiction, uh, both to alcohol and to drugs. He's given me a most wonderful wife and two wonderful daughters. This wonderful congregation I serve, whom I dearly love. Declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood, that's an interesting thing, he who require, requires blood to the people of that day it would have meant that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. When somebody wrongs you, blood is required. When somebody's blood is spilt, your blood is required. For he who requires blood in the end requires the blood of his own son, Jesus, on our behalf. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness, the moral health of God. 
He who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Get this, he remembers us. He does not forget our cry when we are afflicted, whether from uh, without or from this pandemic or afflicted from directly from the enemy. He doesn't forget our cry. And so t today we cry out, remember us, O Lord. Remember your, the world that you love. Remember the world that you gave up your son on the cross, who gave up himself willingly. Remember us, O Lord. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Show me the kindness of your grace. Show us, show everyone listening the kindness of your grace today. See my affliction, see our affliction from those who hate us. Well, those who really hate us, we know now is Satan and his demonic cohorts, his demonic uh, armies. You who lift me up from the gates of death. He has lifted me up from the gates of death several times, probably more times than I even know. I, I blacked out so many times in those five years. I have, there's no way for me to recall all the times of what I did. I have a lot of stories. But he has lifted you from death too. And he will yet lift you from death. Even after we've died, he will lift us from death. That's what we're celebrating this week the hope of the resurrection, to the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. That I may tell of all your praises. You have lifted me from death. 35 years ago, he lifted me from death. That I may tell of your praises. And he has lifted you from the death of your old life to tell of his praises, of the wonder of what he can do to bring us from a life of death and debauchery and sin and rebellion and selfishness to a life filled with his presence, to a life where we are a living temple. We have become the holy of holies, the very abode, the very living place of God on the planet. That in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. The daughter of Zion are the people of the city of Zion, which is Jerusalem. That in the gates of the people of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. Coming in and out of the city. It's interesting that he says that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation because it's through one of those gates that Jesus goes out to Golgotha carrying his cross. And we rejoice in that salvation that Jesus wrought for us on the cross. The nations have sunk down in the pit, here we get back to the judgment, which they have made, in the net which they hid their own foot has been caught. In the net which they hid to trap David, their own foot has been caught. And in the net which they hid to trap Israel, their own foot has caught. Well, think about in our context. The nations have sunk down into the pit which they have made. We knew this was coming. Epi epidemiologists have been warning us for years, even after looking at 1918, the, the flu epidemic of 1918. That was almost 100 years ago, or over just a little over 100 years ago that that happened. And we've known that this could happen, and yet nations put their resource to other things. We were wholly unprepared for this as a nation. The world was wholly unprepared for this. Am I saying this is judgment? Well, what this is saying is the judgment of God is sometimes just removing his hand and allowing us to reap the consequences of our own sin. That's what he did to me in that head injury. He took his hand of protection off my life he had saved me before in remarkable ways. After a, a Grateful Dead concert in, at which I had snorted over almost two grams of Coke in 40 minutes, a lethal dose for somebody who weighed 112 pounds. I lay on my bed and by all means I should have died that night of heart failure. But he saved me. He, he saved my life. Later on, when I had that head injury, he removed his hand of protection, at least partially from me. He didn't let me die, but he, I fell in the pit of my own making. I can't blame anybody. And sometimes as a world, we fall in the pit of our own making. In the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. I don't think that applies to this at all. But I do think that he's allowing it, and he's allowing it for his great love for us, for his compassions for his compassion. He sees the world as, as a world without a shepherd.
The Lord has made himself known. He makes himself known in creation. He makes himself known in the starry hosts. He makes himself known in the beauty of a flower. He makes himself known in the graceful gait of a deer. He makes himself known in the soar of an eagle. He makes himself known in the smile of a human face. The Lord has made himself known, but he has also made himself known in the storms, in the tumult, in the hard times, in the distress, in the affliction. He has executed judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. So get, the judgment is again tied to our being snared in our, as a consequence of our own sin, our own rebellion, and our own selfishness. Jesus says, uh, by the measure you measure to other people, it will be measured unto you. We reap judgment on our own heads. Am I saying that for all those families who have lost loved ones that they put this on their own heads? May it never be. Please don't hear that. We created this pandemic uh, by not being prepared, by not responding it to, to it quickly enough, by governments ignoring it over and over again. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. Higayon, another musical term that we don't know what the instruction meant. And then stop and ponder these things. The wicked will return to Sheol. That's the grave. How do you return to Sheol, this netherworld, this place of the grave, to death? Well, what it means is we started being, uh, how do I say it? We started in non-being. We, we weren't in existence prior to our birth, prior to our conception. And now we return. Uh, the Hebrew people did not have an idea of the afterlife, at least not a well-developed idea. They believed that when someone died, they died. They, they became a non-being. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations who forget God. Are the nations forgetting God today? Has the United States for, forgotten God today? I'll let you be the judge of that. For the needy will not always be forgotten. Hear that today. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. For the needy around the globe will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. I think he's turning the world on its head upside down. He's reversing uh, wealth and the poor remain poor amongst us the homeless remain homeless amongst us and they will not always be forgotten nor the hope of the afflicted those who are being persecuted for the name of Jesus will not be afflicted nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever they will be remembered by God Arise, O Lord. He asked God to stand up from his throne, this throne of judgment, and in our context, this throne of judgment and grace. It's a throne of judgment, and yet it's a throne of grace. Arise, O Lord. Do not let men prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. That's why my ultimate prayer in this pandemic, I pray my request is bring it to an end. But I think as a church, we pray the garden prayer of Jesus not according to our will, but your will be done. Father, whatever happens in this pandemic, Lord, your will be done. Draw people's hearts to you. Let people know the compassion and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let them know that if God is for us, who can be against us? Let them know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Who shall separate us from his love? Shall persecution or distress or tribulation or, or uh, sword or nakedness or peril or sword. No, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And yet, let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Put them in reverence, this fearful reverence, O Yahweh, Jesus. Let the nations know that they are but men. Well, that's one thing I can certainly see in this pandemic that we are realizing that we are but human beings that we are but creatures 
uh, that we are but uh, people made of clay, weak as we are. And then ponder this. I encourage you to read through this psalm again and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Um, again, God loves us. He loves this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son on the cross. For God so loved the world. Right now, he continues to love the world. Right now, his clarion call of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ continues to go out. May you come to know him. May you come to call out on his name, save me, Jesus. May you entrust your life into his wounded hands. May you know his sweet and tender voice calling your, your name. Come home. Come home. It's time to come home. Amen. Let's pray. Father, just uh, thank you for this psalm. These psalms of judgments are sometimes hard to read because I can't help but think I, apart from your grace, I would stand under this most horrific judgment in my life when you would deal with me justly and rightly with equity. If you judge me fairly, Lord, and if you judge most of us listening, well, all of us listening, if you judge us fairly, Lord, we would be toast. We would be destined for eternal destruction in hell. But Lord, you are gracious. You are kind. You are compassionate. You do not forsake us. You promise us, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Or again in Hebrews 13, 5, you promise, by no means will I ever leave you nor forsake sake you. Thank you for being with us, Lord. I pray for everyone listening and for those who will be listening later, that each person, even as they hear my words pass through their ears, that they would know that you are with them, that you have not left us, you have not forsaken us. And in your presence we find rest. You are our stronghold. We will remember your good works, both in the past in, in, in the nations, but also the good works in our lives that you have done those times we have seen your deliverance, your redemption, your righteousness made so clear in our lives. And so today we again pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray for an extraordinary measure that you would fill us with an extraordinary measure of your spirit throughout this day, throughout this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. A little bit longer psalm, 20 verses, the longest psalm we've done so far. I enjoy doing these. We'll be back tomorrow for Psalm 10. Uh, stay safe. Stay home. Please stay home. We hear so many reports of people congregating and gathering together. And by doing that, we're keeping the curve going up. We're keeping uh, the death rate going up. We think, well, it will never hit me. Please don't think that way. Stay safe. Keep others safe. Uh, safe. Please stay home. Uh, um, epidemia epidemiologists know what will flatten the curve and that's our social distancing so take it seriously folks uh, and the God of grace and the God of peace be with you we'll see you tomorrow thank you for worshiping with us today may you know this week the extravagant grace of Jesus the boundless immeasurable love of God and the abiding closer-than-your-skin friendship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.